Welcome, friends, to the second and final day of this short visit, this short event we had in Vienna, Austria. I'm very happy to see you again at this final session. I just uh, met a few monks. They are from Nepal, were sponsored by somebody, and I just had the chance to meet them. And very nice, uh, these monks have been practicing meditation for a long time. And their teaching, very similar. The Buddha's teaching was very similar. And he said that the ultimate salvation can be found within yourself. So he also laid down some rules for external behavior so that the people can practice meditation and so on. But he said the truth lies inside us. So I was happy to meet this monk. And I remember in China last year, I met a very large number of monks. In fact, one abbot, I nominated him to be representative and help people, uh, the Buddhist monks. So they are very much into the meditational practice, so I was happy to see this. But it reminded me of something. One monk asked his master, Master, is it all right for the Buddhist monks to use email? The master said, yes, you can use emails, provided there are no attachments. <laughs> yes, they understand the importance of attachments. Today I want to tell you, what is really the role of a perfect living master? And when he finds us, what happens to us and what can we do in order to take advantage of this great opportunity of going back to our true home? The first thing is that a master only appears for those souls ready to go back home in his time, in his place. It is not that a master comes for the general public so that is why masters travel to places where they are marked souls waiting. They will go out of the way if necessary for a single soul, if their soul is marked to be on their list. So that is why I sometimes say that masters carry a list of marked souls, marked to be taken back to the true home by that master. So they appear and they carry a list. Those on the list, they have to take them back home because that's their role. They come for that. They become masters only for that reason that they are looking at the marked souls, marked right from the beginning of creation, when these souls said, if we get trapped somewhere, will, will we be able to come back? And their own totality said, yes, we will make sure you come back at that time. And it's just a fulfillment of a promise made to these souls to go back. When they are here, a lot of other people also see them. So they also get marked for future masters. Sometime for the same master, mostly for future masters. So therefore, I have just used my own terminology to say they carry a list of marked souls, marked A, list A. And they also have a list B. So ever since I announced that, people have been emailing me, am I in list A or list B? <laughs> you should be able to find that by going within your own self. But if you are able to follow the instructions of a master, as best as you can, you are listing. I'll tell you a story, personal, that happened to my dad. He was also a follower of the same master. And one day, he missed a discourse of the great master. And people who attended the discourse told him, today great master said once 
a master initiates somebody that person will not have more than four lifetimes total in this physical plane if any karma is still left over it can be paid off at higher le levels of astral and causal planes in the evening great master used to have a little short meeting with a few people and i remember my dad and i were present in the evening meeting my dad suddenly popped up the question is it true master that you said in your discourse that once you are initiated you cannot have more than four lives great master said lake raj why are you worried this is your last life so why are you asking this question and my dad said i am asking the question supposing you want a fifth life you are denying me that he said why would you have fifth life he says i understand master return sometimes and if you return you are not going to leave me in that true home by myself so he laughed and then he explained he said our mind being what it is and as the different yugas the different eons of life pass distractions become more and more and it becomes more and more difficult to the, to do the kind of meditation and practices that people could do when there were no distractions there was nothing available so meditation was easy in these difficult times and more difficult times will come these difficult times nobody can do meditation perfectly people can try but the mind will distract them and it's very difficult to do perfect meditation therefore he said if a person initiated by a master does his best or her best to follow the instructions that will be the last life and that is list a master will take him back in this life nobody is perfect nobody can be perfect with the kind of minds we have so that is why anybody who is following instructions doing the best in meditation following the other instructions masters give will be taken back in this very life and he said those who do not follow and have doubts continuously running in them they will get one more life in order to improve their performance improve their meditation in the second life and go back only those who completely abandon abandon this path and say it's no good they may have to get some inkling of the nature of the path in the next life and may come for us one more life only those who turn against masters even hurt them kill them they will only come in the fourth life is not that everybody has to come in the fourth life so he made it clear that if you just follow the instructions that are given by a master this is your last life it does not say that you cannot come again but that will be your choice once you find out the illusionary nature of this universe you not mind having another experience but so long as you take it as real you don't want to come back here so this is a decision you make not here but at a different level when masters appear they are ordinary people but there are some signs which are there very clearly in every perfect living master and i want to mention those signs first sign a perfect living master will never say he is a master it's not necessary for him to say that if he says that it is a function of his ego to say i am a master and masters don't have that kind of ego if they still have they are still disciples they have not become masters so that is why these perfect living masters never claim to be masters they claim to be the servants of their masters they claim to be sevadars they claim that they are come to serve people and to serve their masters so they don't take any credit on themselves they give all the credit to their master baba saban singh who was my master anything that good happened we say master you helped us yes my baba jamal singh did it he would always give credit to his master and not take any credit for himself though i have a suspicion that he did a lot of things but he never claimed credit 
just the way these masters act here. Secondly, they do not perform any public miracles. They live like ordinary people. But they, they do a large number of private miracles for their disciples. Privately, the miracles happen in their life. They say, this couldn't have happened except for master. We say it over and over again. When we share our experience with somebody else, they say, this is not a miracle, just a coincidence has happened. It just had to happen that way. So that is why their miracles are hidden. And they are very good convincing miracles for the disciples. But nobody else can be equally affected by those miracles. So that is another key. That they are not jugglers coming street shows or something. That they are doing something very silently and quietly in a world that is a negative world basically. And they are giving positive experiences to their disciples. Thirdly, they always earn their own living. They don't depend upon the donations and charity of people to make a living. They will always work on their own and the donations and charities that are received, they do it for the people and they use it for logistical reasons. If they have to arrange meetings, they have to arrange a place for meetings, they will spend that money on those things but not on their own living. That's another characteristic of them. And thirdly, if you deal with them over time, you'll find they will never get angry, no matter what the provocation. You can provoke them as many times as you like. You will never see anger on them. In their own jobs, what they're doing, they can sometimes play the role what is required, including showing uh, affirmative states of even anger it looks like anger but inwardly you can see the smile never goes away from them and that's a very unique feature in these masters similarly you will sever, never see them punishing anybody they're always forgiving their compassion comes natural to them when they look at us and they find our life we have done so many things wrong, which our own mind is saying that should not have been done. And we feel guilty about them. And we go to master and they never punish. They see in what state we are. It calls for compassion. The way we are trapped in this world, the way we are trapped with the law of karma, they have compassion for our state. Not because what our behavior is like. Our behavior is all being created by our karmas here. So they don't judge. They have no judgment at all. It's only love that they show to all their disciples. A very unique feature. And their love is unconditional with no judgment. I remember a man once came to great master in the evening. He was sitting reading mail and giving some dictation to three or four people who were his secretaries and correspondents to answer different letters he got from different parts of the world. So he had named people who could write in English, who could write in uh, local languages, write in Deutsch, German. So they were taking down his notes and preparing the letters. Um, and I and uh, my dad and some others were just sitting around just to have his darshan, just to have a look at him while he was working. He allowed a few people to sit around when he was working. A man comes running. Master, forgive me, I have sinned. You told me not to eat meat. I had a lot of meat last night. You told me not to drink alcohol. I was totally drunk last night in bad company. You told me lead a good moral life. I was womanizing along with my other f friends. It was a terrible party I had. And I know I did not follow your orders. Please forgive me. Great master said, okay, you are forgiven. Just avoid these things, but uh, you are forgiven. And he said, thank you, thank you, thank you. And he ran away. The secretaries who were sitting there got surprised. They said, Master, this man committed big sins. He did not follow your orders. And he just said, forgive me, and you said, forgiven. 
Supposing he does the same thing again and comes back to you, will you forgive him again? He said, yes, I will forgive him again. Master, when will you punish him? And great master said, keep me on the side of forgivers, not on the side of punishers. His own mind punished him more than you can imagine. A mind sitting in our own heads is punishing us all the time. Why should masters also join the negative entities and punish anybody? That is why their compassion and forgiveness is of the highest order. Something very rare to see amongst human beings. So I am mentioning these few points. As you associate with these perfect masters, you will notice these things. There are, of course, many people who pretend to be masters because they love the attention that masters get. They love the, sometimes they love the money. They're being donated, which they use it for their own purpose. Sometimes they misuse their position in many other ways. Those masters do not have these characteristics that I have mentioned. Some of them try to copy, but in extreme provocation, they break down. I remember one day, I was young, I remember the size, maybe eight, nine years old, and a man came claiming to be a master, and he listened to great master discourse, and after discourse was over, he sat on a platform in the Dera and began to give his own satsangs, and a lot of people gathered. And he talked of his being above, he claimed he was in Parabrahm and he was beyond the mind. And I happened to pass by and I looked at him. The way he was claiming what he is, is not true of any perfect master. So I said, a little trick I should play on him. I had, by chance that day, on my handkerchief, a safety pin. If something breaks up, I used to carry one safety pin, just tie it up. I had a safety pin. I opened the safety pin. When he was claiming uh, parabram and things, I quietly went and poked the pin. <laughs> he screamed. And I ran. I knew I could run faster than him. <laughs> he tried to chase me. And I still remember telling him, where are the five boys? You know, these anger, lust, all these we call five boys because they say that at some point they disappear in meditation. So I was shouting at him, you claim all this. So the little provocation, a safety pin can break down the whole sparbrum knowledge of a person. So such people also exist. And according to great master, where there's one perfect living masters, in the same area, there'll be at least 11 such imposters. This is a design by the negative power that runs this universe to prevent too many people escaping from here. The negative power, which they call call or time, the time that has trapped us here, the time has made this arrangement that it fights for every soul that tries to live here. And therefore, it doesn't want this to become a commonly known thing. So these fake masters are performing a function. They are performing a function. We don't know who is real, who is fake. So a lot of people get divided and take time. But those who are marked are never affected by these. The others who are still waiting for list B, C, they, those list people can be held back for a few more lifetimes. So what is uh, the truth is, anybody who has had a chance to look at the face of a perfect living master gets onto one of the lists. Therefore, they try to avoid. The negative power tries to avoid too many souls going and having even darshan of a master. A darshan of a master is a very important thing because we are looking at a human being whose face at that time is just like our face but behind the face is awareness of everything, of the physical plane, of the astral plane, causal plane, true home, totality, 
everything is known and is part of the awareness of that human being. A human being with an ordinary mask of a face is holding that kind of awareness. So looking at that face affects us, affects our soul. And sometimes just one darshan makes us, converts us into a genuine seeker. It has happened with so many people. So that is why darshan is considered very important. I heard a story about darshan. It's a story my mother-in-law told me. I took my mother-in-law very seriously to be a good son-in-law. There are all, so many jokes made about mother-in-law. So I said I should not be part of the joke. <laughs> they say there is something called mixed feelings. Have you heard of mixed feelings? We are both good and bad feelings come at the same time. An example given of that is when your mother-in-law drives your new Rolls Royce across the cliff. <laughs> mixed feelings. <laughs> anyway, I, I'm only uh, saying that I was being careful. The story goes like this, that once upon a time, there was a, a holy man, a Muni, there are many ranks they give to holy people, Rishi, Muni, and the Swamis, and they, they categorize Swami of 108 beads mala, a bigger super Swami who was 1,008 beads of mala, of the beads there. And so there are categories, but this one famous Muni, his name was Narad. Narad Muni is famous, and many stories are made of Narad Muni. He had access to the gods of creation and sustenance. Brahma, Vishnu, Shiva, he could talk to them in his meditation. That was, it was so claimed. So one day, Narad Muni used to go from place to place and telling stories to people. One day, he saw a large crowd of people running. He said, where are you running? They said, a perfect master has come. We are running to get his darshan. He said, what is darshan? Oh, we want to see him. That's his darshan, to look at him. He said, what's the value of darshan? Just looking at a man, what does he do? And they said, you don't know anything. And they ran. So he said, let me go to the source. So he meditated and manifested Brahma, the creator. And he talked to Brahma in meditation and said, Brahmaji, what is the, this great value of Darshan of a master, all those people were running just for that, just to see the face of a person. What's the value? And Brahmaji said, that's an important question. Go to a nearby village. There is a pond of water and there's a snake there in that water. Go and ask this question from the snake. He will give you an answer. So under the orders of Brahmaji, the creator, he walked over and found the pond in the next village and there was a snake with his head up and he asked the snake, Mr. Snake, I am just translating, <laughs> he said, Mr. Snake, what is the value of having darshan of a master, just looking at the master? And the snake looked at him, dropped his head and died. He said this was no answer. So he meditated again and manifested Brahmaji again. He said, Brahmaji, you told me that the answer will come from a snake. That I looked at the snake and the snake died, gave me no answer. Brahmaji said, oh, I'm so sorry to hear that. I suggest you go to a further down village. He said, far down, but you go there. And there is a man who has a new parrot. So you ask this question from the parrot and he will give you the answer. So Narada Muni traveled all the way to that village and asked, has there somebody living who's got a new parrot? Oh, yes, there's one businessman. He just bought a new parrot. So he went to that businessman's house, said, can I have a look at your parrot? I believe you have a new parrot. This certainly, Narada Muni, you are coming to see a parrot, lucky parrot. So Narada Muni asked the parrot, Mr. Parrot, what is the benefit 
of looking at the face of a person they call a master, any benefit? The parrot looked at Dharat Muni and hung his head down and died. He said, what kind of game is this going on? So he went into meditation again. And this time, Brahma, you said, I'm very sorry to hear, but I will get you the answer. You have to travel very far now. It'll take you months and months to travel, but don't worry. You have to go to a neighboring kingdom. And in that kingdom, the queen has just given birth to a baby boy. You go and ask this question from that baby boy. He'll give you the answer. And Narad Muni was little, very little troubled that these two died. I'd wonder what will happen to the baby boy. But he traveled all that distance. Several months took place. And then he reached that kingdom. And he went to the palace. And the king received him. He said, very lucky that after a long time you have come in this direction. He said, I have come for a very serious matter. Did the queen give birth to a baby boy? Oh yes. oh, yes, just now. They gave birth just a few months back. I'm very happy that you came asking about it. He says, I would like to meet that baby boy, but I want to meet alone. Nobody should be there. So this is certainly a very lucky baby that you, Banarad Muni, has come to see him. So he went the little baby boy in the cradle. He said, Mr. Baby, what is the benefit of having a darshan of a master? And the baby spoke. He said, Narad Muni, I am the same snake you saw in the pond. I am the same parrot you saw in the cage. You are not a perfect master. You are just a Muni. But just looking at Muni, I was able to change my form quickly. And from snake became a parrot, from parrot became a human being. It's all because of my seeing, looking at you. The benefit of looking at the face of a perfect living master is a thousand times more. That's how Narad Muni got the answer about Darshan. So this story I heard, and I know that this is just a story, but actually I have noticed that when people get the Darshan of a perfect living master, the life changes. It's as if they have been now marked sheep. They become marked even by the Darshan. My dad also heard similar story, and he said, the best thing I can do for any friends of mine is to give them the opportunity to see the master. Not say anything. Not tell them what to learn. Not tell them anything about the spiritual path. Just take them to see the master. And so many people, his friends, he said, that's the best deal I can give them. He took them just to introduce the master. Some of them became such deep meditators and great disciples of the great master that I who grew up even beyond that I also saw that happening there was one professor who became so humble after this darshan that he went to great master he said master I want to follow your instructions I want to be as humble as possible give me poverty Give me illness. Give me a rough life, but never leave me. Great Master smiled. Many years later, Great Master died, my dad died, everybody died. That professor was still living, but he was in the hospital and he was almost dying. So he sent for me and I went to him. He's on his deathbed in the hospital. They declare he is terminally ill. He will not get out of hospital. So he tells me, Ishwar, I want to tell you, I made a very big mistake. I asked great master, give me poverty, give me illness, and make me humble. He gave me poverty. He gave me illness. He gave me whatever I asked. Please, Ishwar, remember, Never ask for these things from your master. Ask for the very best. And he will give you the very best. He says, I am telling you from my experience, the power of these masters. Whatever you utter with your tongue and say, give me, they give you. 
So do not make the mistake. He was telling me, teaching me. I was very impressed with that. I said, I am very happy that I got a much better deal from the great master. And that deal I got much earlier. I was still young. And I heard a discourse. In the great master's time, they used to have one scripture or some spiritual holy book from which a chanter would chant and then he would interpret. That's the normal way. So one day I was listening to him and one line came from the Guru Granth Sahib, the Sikh scripture. It said, I repeat the words and then translate. Kaya nagar nagar hai niko vich sodha har ras ki jai. It means this body is like a township and big deals are going on this. If you want to have true deal with, with Hari or the God himself, that deal should be done inside. It was just talking about a deal in a marketplace in the body. So I went to great master. I said, master, I heard you make deals also. And you make deal there. Can I make a deal now, right now, in front of you? He said, certainly. What is the deal? I said, deal, according to me, means a business deal. I give you something, you give me something. Isn't that correct? He said, yes, that is a deal. That's a business, that's a transaction in a marketplace. I said, take all my worries, take all my unhappiness. And give me all success and happiness throughout life. I didn't know what the answer will be. Great Master said, done deal. I can tell you today, at age 91, I can tell you, he has kept his word, I have kept mine. Deal became true. That's the kind of deal. So when that professor told me, I said, how lucky I was to ask for the right deal. Why should we ask for something bad from a master? Why should we ask for suffering from a master? Are we not suffering enough already? Does suffering make us humble? Not at all. Humility comes when your ego is not the foremost part of you. Love replaces ego. You are automatically humble. But when we start claiming we are humble, we want to be humble, that's big ego. Because think it's great to be humble. You have humility, so the ego rises. I am very humble. If a man comes to me and says, I am the greatest, I can poke a needle and say, you are not. But if a man says, I am the humblest, there is no way to correct him. And yet I can see, I am the humblest. It's a very big ego. It's the same problem that the man has who says, I am the greatest. No difference. Humility is a way of living. It's not the statements we make. That is why this is a big lesson I'm sharing with you. If you get a chance, ask for the best from your master. Don't go into this assumption that you have to ask for something that is not good for you. Ask whatever you can think is the best. Master will give you that which actually is your best, may not be what you have asked for, but it will be the best. At, at this age, I can look back on my life and tell you this is a correct experience. There was another master, disciple of the great master who also heard the same thing about the importance of darshan. But before he could really meet the master, he lived in a little small town about 20 miles away from the Dera called Kapoorthala in Punjab. He was a veterinary doctor. His name was Dr. Ishar Singh, Ishar Singh. And he was very keen to find a true master. So he, every master who came, every preacher who would come, of any religion that would come, he would go attend his meetings, but was never fully satisfied. Then he had three neighbors. They were Muslim neighbors in his neighborhood. They said, there is a master, a perfect living master, who is not very far from here. He lives about 20 miles away from our house and three miles down along the river Bias, 
down the river Bias, there is a small little hut in which he lives. And the main road from where that alley starts, that small lane starts, that goes along the river, is on the bank of that river. You can just go see, it's three, three miles downstream. So one day he decided to go and see the mast. He used to normally take care of horse, horses and camels and elephants of the, of the prince, the Maharaja of Kapurthala. But he had a bike on which he used to no, travel for a private journey. So one evening after work, he get, got on his bike and went to look for the master down three miles downstream. And he went three miles, no sign of any dera, no sign of any hut there. He asked somebody, is there a master here? He said, I don't know anything. Maybe, maybe three miles more. They went three miles more. That's another problem in India sometimes, the villages, if you say how far is the place, they say it is one ko or a mile and a half or two ko or three miles. After three miles, it's still three miles. So that's just an idea they give. So he went down about eight miles, the sun set and it was dark. And there was a boatman, there was a boat crossing on the river, Bias. And he asked the boatman, I have come down eight miles, nine miles down, and I don't see any dera. He says, you are on the wrong side of the river. The dera is on the other side of the river. And you come to the wrong side. He said, can I go in your boat to the other side. He said, at this time, there, there is no real road or pathway on the other side. You will have a big difficulty. This boat is only for one isolated village on the other side. You can't go up north from there. There is no roadway. There is no pathway. There is no place even to take a bicycle. He said, doesn't matter. I'll carry my bike on my head, but I have to go tonight. So the boatman ultimately agreed, took him on the other side to the village, and he began to trace his way up north as best as he could with thorns and all. He had to carry the bike on his head and it took hours. Sometimes he would lose the way. He would try to go near the river. Reached early morning. Little small hut. Two rooms actually, very small rooms. And that was where the dera was. So he knocked on the door and an elderly lady opened the door and she began to abuse him. How dare you come and disturb the master at this hour? Do you have no sense? And he, she used such abusive language and so much anger. He had heard there is a lady who is there taking care of the great master, who's, who has taken care of master's master, who has even been a disciple of master's master's master. That lady's name is... Bibi Ruko, and that, that Bibi Ruko, very nice lady, she's there. And he saw this is the same lady with so much anger. He said, if this lady has spent her life with three masters and her anger has not gone, what am I going to get here? There is this is not a master. And with all his doubts creeping back, that nothing is here, he went back to Kapurthala. In the morning, he told his neighbors, the Muslim neighbors, I went to see the great master, as you, prom you said he's a master. I don't think he's a master. So there was a lady, and she has spent time with three masters. And her anger is not under control. Her language is so abusive. If she had learned nothing from the masters, what am I going to learn from them? This is not a master. And they smiled and laughed. They said, master played a trick on you. He said, what trick? Masters play tricks like this. Yes, did you go to see the lady or the master? I went to see the master. But you only saw the lady. This is a very kind lady. She did all this to put you off and see how serious you are about seeing the master. You failed. You should try again. So he said, maybe there is some sense in that. I will try and see the master. So he found out little more details, Master is a working engineer and comes only on weekends and gives discourse 
on, sun, on Saturday evening at 5 o'clock and goes away back to his work on Sunday. So he came on one Saturday evening back. And he saw the master had just finished his work, was sitting outside the huts, the same huts, a little chair. And he went and he said, Master, I have come before to see you, but I saw that lady. The lady was very kind to him that day. But I made a mistake. I have read your books. I have heard about you from my neighbors. I want initiation from you. I want to follow you. Great Master said, have you broken your arm? He said, is that a requirement for initiation? He said, no, it's not a requirement. It just so happens that in your destiny it is so written that the initiation will come after you break your arm and get it healed, you will get initiated. He said, Master, why should I break my arm? He said, you know, these accidents happen. Sometimes one can fall from a horse. He said, I have been riding horses all my life. I didn't fall from a horse. Why would I fall from a horse? He said, these things happen, you know. But I can tell you, I will initiate you. You are a marked soul. But the time will be after you break your arm, get it healed and come back to me. And I'll initiate you. Surprised and puzzled, he went back. When he went back, his wife, Maya, whose name was Maya, she shouted at him, where have you been all day? The Maharaja has been calling you all day, has sent so many messages, and he's wondering where you have disappeared. He needs you immediately. Run to the palace. So Isha Singh ran to the palace, and the Maharaja said, where have you been? He said, I went to see one Maharaji. The, the master used to be called Maharaji. He said, there is no Maharaji. I am the Maharaja only. You waste your time going to these other so-called Maharajis. There are no Maharajis. Anyway, he said, saying, let me tell you why I was calling you. Only today I have got two new horses straight from Saudi Arabia. Arabian states. Wonderful, beautiful horses. And I have told everybody, he said, saying, and I will inaugurate these horses and ride together in, today. I've been waiting all day for you to come so we can ride these horses. Isha Singh said, Maharaj, I will not ride the horse. He said, what has happened to you? No, I was told that I'll fall from the horse. You've been riding with me every day. What makes you think you will fall from the horse? No, that Maharaj told me. Do you believe the superstitious things that people tell you? It doesn't happen like that. No, please forgive me today. Take somebody else. He said, okay, save my face, Maharaja said, that uh, at least you get on the horse and get off. I'll go along. At least they will see, take picture, photo of both of us getting on the horse together. Okay, I'll do that. He got on the horse. Maharaja got on the horse. Maharaja galloped off. His horse just tripped as he got on, on a little stone. And he fell, the horse fell on him, and he had a double fracture on his right arm. He said, I knew that man's words are very powerful. I could feel them. It had to happen. Anyway, it took a long time for his ball in plaster, right up to the shoulder. Very bad fracture. It took a long time, normally take three weeks, four weeks, took six, seven, eight weeks for it to heal. They took the plaster off took the plaster off, there was calcification to such an extent he could not move his arm even after healing. But he went back to great master. Master, I broke my arm, I am healed now, please initiate me. Great master said, raise your right hand to your ear. He said, master, I can't do it. He said, sorry, I can't initiate. <laughs> what, every time you put some new conditions? What is this initiation that you require? What is the hand to do? He said, it has something to do. But I did not say, break your arm and come back. I said, break your arm and get healed and come back. You haven't got healed. He says, Master, this is a very tough thing to heal. There's a calcification on my arm. And there's no way that I can remove that. He said, when your horses fall and break their legs, what do you do? Do you kill them or do you save them? I save them, but it's very hard. I use very strong nitric acid and some other strong acids to dissolve that calcification. 
and the horse is in so much pain that he hits the ground, makes a hole in the ground. It's so bad, the treatment. Great Master said, why don't you try a little bit of that? He said, Master, I'll die with that. No, 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 you dilute the nitric acid a little bit. You dilute it and then try, you'll get healed, then you can come. It was only after that this treatment, which was painful, he said, all the story I've heard direct from him. After he healed, he went back and he got initiated. After getting initiated, and he, he made good progress. He was a wonderful disciple. I spent a lot of time with him. I loved him. Beautiful man. In fact, when I was holding an important position in the government, I was chief secretary of a state government in my career at that time. And he used to come to see me. But I was so busy, he had to wait outside the room. I felt very bad to make him wait. But he would wait for all day. And the staff, my staff, would sometimes say, why are you disturbing the boss? You should not come every day. And then he would try to come to the house. And my wife, say, my wife would turn him away. Don't you realize I know I've got spies sitting there that you were in the office meeting my husband. And now you come home also. Please spare him some rest. Let him have a cup of tea or something and he comes back. You rush immediately after that. So he didn't know what to do. But his love was very strong. Then he found out my wife loves pakoras with tea. You know what's pakoras? The fritters? And that little snack. And so what he did from after that was before he left the office, he would come to my house and call my wife, baby, nice pakoras here today. She said, come in, come in, doctor. <laughs> so every time I would go back to work, they were having pakoras and tea. So he found a way. So much love he had. So he also believed that you have to have a darshan of a master and you can get anything. Darshan is a key to becoming spiritual. His father was a very strong Sikh who did not believe that there can be a human being, a guru after the ten gurus, and that the holy book, Guru Granth Sahib, is the guru now for all times. And when he tried to explain to his father that this is, this is not true, the whole, all ten gurus were human beings. Nowhere in the Granth Sahib, in that book, it says that a book can be a guru. In fact, it says if you keep on reading any book, over and over again for your whole life, you'll get nothing but your ego. It says something very different. I have found a master who corresponds to the, what is written in the Guru Granth Sahib. His dad said, no way. I cannot, being a true Sikh, I cannot follow any human being as a guru. For me, the Granth is the guru. So please don't try that stunt on me. He tried many times to make his father at least come and see the guru. Just once. He said, if he can just cast his eyes once on the face of the great master, my job is done. I have done my best duty as a son of this father. But the father wouldn't agree. One day he said, let me try another trick. He went to great master. He said, by the way, I don't know, I'm telling stories. I hope you'll enjoy these stories of great master. The great master, he said, Master, my father is not willing to come to see you. But I want him to see you. Have your darshan. Can we make a plan? Next week, you are going out of town on the train. And before you board the train, you always go 10-15 minutes early. Can I bring my dad, by some excuse, to the railroad station? And then you can give him a little darshan. He says, certainly, try so on the day the great master had reached the platform of the railway station and he told his dad, Dad, I have some work with the station master, the station superintendent there for a few minutes. Would you like to come along with me? He said, okay, son, I'll come with you. So both of them rode in their horses and he said, Dad, will you hold my horse? I'll just go see the station master and come back. So he said, okay. So he held the horse and Isha Singh ran down the platform. He said, Master, 
Bapu is here. Bapu meant dad. He called him Bapu. Bapu is here. Come. Great man says, yes. And they both ran. Now can I imagine? I'm imagining, oh, both running. The great master with the white beard. This man, they're running up to give darshan to a man. By the time there was a little dip in the platform, you had to come stairs down. So they, as they were running up the stairs, I don't know how the father suspected there's something going on. He left, he said, saying, horse, and he had already gone. So when they went up, master said, where's your dad? He said, he's run away again. He said, I'm sorry. I'm sorry I could not see him. We'll go back again. They left for a train. One day, Isha Singh said, if this is such an important thing for me to do, I have to find a better way. So once early morning, he brought a long, big rope. And when the dad was sleeping on his bed, those are small cottages. I mean, small cots, not uh, big beds like we have. And he, while the dad was sleeping, he suddenly wrapped the bed <laughs> along with the dad and tied him up in there. Dad got up, what are you doing? He said, I am going to take you to my master. He said, is this the way to take anybody to a master? You think by tying me up, you will convert me to follow the master? What nonsense, you are mad. He said, whether you are mad or not, I am going to take you to the master. <laughs> he had arranged a tonga, a horse cart, to come and take the, the, all that few miles that he was to go, 15, 20 miles. And that horse cart was waiting outside. And he carried that bed with the dad on it and went and put it on the horse cart, tied it even more there. <laughs> and the father screamed, my son has gone mad. All the neighbors came out. He said, saying he was a well-respected man. What has happened? I said, he said his father's got some in, insane insanity. I'm taking him to hospital. He said, I am not mad, my son is mad. And they all said, take him quickly. <laughs> so there is, the, there is a horse cart coming with a man screaming, tied up with ropes. And there is the, there are the two small huts and great master sitting outside on the chair. And when he sees this great sight, a man coming on a horse cart tied up and screaming. And he's just sitting on his own horse next to it. He got up. He said, what nonsense, what nonsense is this? Isha Singh said, I brought my father for your darshan. <laughs> he said, you are mad? Is this how to bring a father? The father said, I have been telling him the same thing. He is mad. And great master said, he is mad to bring you like this. Tie him, uh, untie him. He said, told the seva are there. Untie, look at how he's treating his dad. The dad said, yes, that's what I'm telling him. There's no way to bring to anybody. So it untied. And they said, take him, apply some bombs and something. Apply something. He's hurting himself with all the ropes around him. So great master said, take him in. And he's just saying, he was waiting outside. After a few minutes, great master comes out. And he says quietly, now you go, come after three days. He says, he says, three days, what will happen? Three months won't be enough for this man to understand, great master. Anyway, he came back after three days. And when he came on the horse, and he saw the great master sitting, and his dad standing in front like this. He rubbed his eyes, couldn't believe them. That's my dad, that's Bapu standing there. When he was getting down from the horse, the horse dirtied the place, shit the place. And his father took off his shirt and went to clean the place and said, you are always foolish and mad. You messing up the place right in front of a Satguru sitting here. He said, Bapu, is that you? He said, you never told me who he is. He's a perfect master. And I am so lucky that only this morning he initiated me. Isha Singh was totally surprised. Great master said, when the time comes, he used to use the word ziriya ban jata hai. That means, a means, some means come about to bring us to a master. And sometimes they call them strange coincidences or strange happenings that come, which bring us to a master. If we are a marked soul, 
it doesn't matter how we come. It's all an arrangement to get to a master and see his face. So a perfect living master is an ordinary human being, but extraordinary in his awareness. That awareness makes him extraordinary, not the life that he is leading, just ordinary life, like ourselves. So that is why I'm sharing these stories with you about the great master. I remember him and so many miracles he has shown. So many things have happened. And he would make sure to tell me, even in my regular life, that nothing, no success of mine is due to me. It's because of him. How did he demonstrate it? I'll tell you. In a certain examination, I had to pass the exam in order to get a service, a higher service from the job I was doing. I wanted to get promoted to a better job. Tried very hard, failed. Tried even harder, failed. And my colleague said, that job you're looking for is not meant for people like you. So I gave up. Third time stood first in the whole university. Same exam. Same thing in the civil service exam. Tried hard, failed. Tried more hard, failed. Third time, gave up, got selected. That doesn't, it means that he was also showing to me who you are. You are one and two, three is me. And that is how he's, he is able to even demonstrate to us how we are such small fries compared to what he's giving us. And we succeed in life and in meditation the same way. That is why they say the success comes to us on the spiritual path if we can surrender. The surrender is very important. The surrender takes care of our ego. Otherwise, I can do it. I am this eye. This eye is very strong. And he breaks the eye. I am living in a suburb of Chicago now, in America. And there is, we had to get a house when I moved from India to Chicago. We were looking for a house. And a realtor who was a follower of a master, I said, can you help me please find a house? His name is Don, Don Uliberry. He said, I'll find a house. My wife laid down the specifications. House should have a land, should have a garden, should all requirements that she needed. I didn't have any particular requirement except the roof on my head. But then uh, I had to satisfy my wife, my old karma. <laughs> it, it happens, you know, it happens. I mean, I must tell you the truth. <laughs> and one day, uh, she got angry with the Don. What Don did, he bought, found a house for us and said, can I also live with you? The realtor. I said, sure, you can stay also. So he lives in the basement, we live in the top. And the, my, my wife used to servants and all that in India, thought one more servant has come. He said, I'm a real estate agent who got you the house. Don't do this. She scolded him so badly. He felt very mad. Next day he saw she scolding me same badly. And he said, oh, this is a common thing. I am like him. And he felt very happy. <laughs> so we learned, I told him, do you know she is doing the best job that has been assigned to her? And that is to scold us every day. Because when she scolds, she doesn't hit us. She hits her ego. It's the ego always that is being hit. So it's a good thing. Now when she scolds us, we say thank you. So things change just by an understanding that's the ego that is being hit. But you could take it a different way and also react very differently. But if you know that we have a problem with our ego, our eyeness creates a problem on the spiritual path. Because the eyeness is a face of the mind, the thinking mind. The thinking mind creates the eye. And the I separates you from everybody. If there was no I, we would all be together and one. The I separates. The ego separates us. Whereas Master's love unites us. So the positive things unite. And the negative I separates. 
mind to understand anything was to break it into pieces and see. Its method always is analytical. Analytical means it analyzes by putting it separate. It wants to have a relationship. It's always separate. I and you. It's always a division by the mind. Love unites. Love makes you forget that you are separate. Love makes you forget that you are divided. So that is why the positive side unites us. And their method of love is synthesis, joining together. The truth is synthesis, that we are one. Eventually we are one. We are coming from one source. Even if you don't realize that source, as you get together, you find you are one. That you, there's so much common on the spiritual front and so much difference in our daily life. So that is why the mind that is functioning to divide us creates an ego. And so long as the ego is strong, you can't even appreciate love. You must have seen yourself how even true love that comes in our way in this physical world with human beings, the ego drives us away from that love. We don't use ego to increase love because ego separates us. Ego says, I love you. I mentioned yesterday that the I can be so strong, it can create attachments. But the ego, I am attached, I am doing this for you. What are you doing? Love is being made into a business transaction. That I am giving you something, I am doing something for you. What are you doing for me? That's all love. That, that business transaction cannot be called love. Love makes you forget the I. Love makes you forget the beloved becomes so important that you do not think of the I. So that is why this ego, anything that's happening to us, hitting at our ego, like an insult. People are offended. He insulted me. I will take it out on him. No. He insulted me. He didn't insult me. He insulted my I. He insulted my ego. Always welcome it. If you have just this little change, realizing that the soul can never be insulted. There's no way to insult the soul. Soul to soul is always love. Mind to mind can be insult. Ego to ego is insult. It's a battle between ego and ego. So to, to see some people helping you to hit at your ego, please don't fight back. Say thank you. We know who you are hit. You hit our ego, not ourself, not the soul. So that changes our life itself. You know, we get into an argument so easily, which is not necessary. And many of us realize afterwards that argument didn't serve any purpose. And the man we try to argue to persuade him for something never changes. As the English poet has said, a man convinced against his will is of the same opinion still. You can't convince somebody against their will. So there's no use arguing. One Swami once came and a young lady got up and she said, Swamiji, I and my husband fight all the time. Can you give some solution that we can not fight? He said, yes, I can give you a solution. You bring a bottle of water and I'll bless it. And that will end your dispute. So she brought a bottle of water and the Swami repeated some mantras on it. and said, this is blessed water. Now this will solve your problem. She says, how often should I give it to my husband? It's not for your husband. It's for you. And I'll tell you how to use it. When your husband says something of an argument, you take one sip of it and hold it in your mouth. <laughs> Don't swallow. When the husband can't say any more, swallow it. If he starts again, take another sip. There will be no argument. So now, in, in a dramatic way he presented this, all he was saying is that argument takes two, doesn't take one. So you can make it one, there's no argument. If you do not react, it's a very useful thing. The law of karma is based upon what we deliberate in our head and do. If you don't deliberate, just take it, this is over. It will be over. Somebody hits you, somebody insults you, 
And you say, thank God it's over. I, I owed it to him. I must have insulted him or hit him in my past life. And he's taken it off, finished. Supposing we now react to it, new karma again created. We'll come again for do the same thing. You can end the cycle of these kinds of old karmas by not reacting. It's only reacting to these things that creates new karma. So that is why a good lesson. The best thing is keep your mouth shut. Use two ears, one mouth, and that also minimal. Ears more. Use ears much more. Because listen. Listening is the greatest quality that we have. If we listen to somebody and not speak, just listen, you solve many problems. I don't know how, uh, how many of you have had the experience that people who ask you question, if you just listen to them carefully, they get the answer. Just listen carefully. I tell you a very interesting true story. Do we have time for that? I'll just tell the story. True story. I came from India. I used to visit America on business as well as on per personal invitations to meet friends and chat like I'm doing with you now. It was, a, it was a periodic every year or every second year I would come. So they would invite me and uh, I couldn't afford the air ticket. They say we can get the air tickets. I said I have to earn my air tickets. So I did some palm readings and to cover the ticket price, which they would pay with my palm reading, $30 per person, they would get reimbursed. I was not a very good palm reader. <laughs> but I used the normal methods to first talk to people, hear something, then tell them the same thing from the palm. <laughs> it is very common. Uh, palmists do that. There was one palmist uh, in India. He could predict whether the newborn child will be a male or female, boy or girl. In Indian families, it was important to have boys. So he would go, they would call him, because he was always right. They would call him, tell us, this, our girl is getting, is pregnant with a child, will it be boy or girl? He'd say, oh, I can tell you, surely it will be a boy. And they would give him sweets, and they'll give him a little extra donation. He's given good news, it'll be a boy. If it's a boy, they call him again, give him more sweets. If it's a girl, he would say, ask your neighbors. Because every time he would tell the neighbors, you know, I had to say boy to keep up their spirit. It'll be girl. Every time he was right. If it was a girl, ask the neighbors. If it's a boy, give me more sweets. So I know and then this little art of palm reading. So I would read the palm in $30 and put it in the travel fund to get the tickets. So it was a very different kind of visits I was making. I was not working in the United States, just visiting. Because of the palm reading, people thought I am a psychic or somebody who knows. So they wanted me to meet the American psychics, the psychics who can find out uh, more about you. There was one psychic, he could even trace where a lost person is or a lost object of value, like jewelry piece is. He could tell, find there, and they would find. His name was Scotty. And there were other psychics also. So my host one day said, I want you to meet the local psychics I'm arranging a meeting. I said, okay, I'm not a psychic. He said, oh, you are. The way you, palm is merely an excuse. You, look, you don't even look at the palm when you're giving, giving a reading. You look at the person and you can tell him. I said, no, I'm not a psychic, but I love to meet your psychics. I'd like to see. So he invited about 10 or 12 psychics, and they were assembled around a long table on both sides. I am sitting there. They're asking me questions like, do you believe in numerology? Do you think the numbers have any value? I would say, oh, yes, yes, numbers have good value. They'd be very satisfied with my good answer. They would ask, is there a connection between a horoscope chart that we draw 
and what is in the palm are they corresponding to each other do the planets on the palm represent the same oh yes yes they are very common they say very good he knows everything okay so anyway we had that meeting but they were very funny people long beards very bleary eyes and they were the psychics and i was very surprised to see that group of people but in the second row because the chairs were all taken second row was scotty that sharp psychic he had a round face a very bright eyes and he, what when i was answering their questions he would speak up with a smile tell me what you come to tent for tell me the message you have brought for me i said i brought no message for him what can i tell him i i would turn my attention to the other side he would pick up his chair and go to the other side <laughs> and ask the same question again tell me you come to tell me something tell me i would turn this side then <laughs> he got very frustrated and he told the uh, organizer uh, of that meeting he said he is not telling my uh, what he has come to tell me and i keep on asking him he is answering everybody else except me i feel very bad and my host said tomorrow i have set half an hour for myself i'll give it to you you can ask whatever you like i'll surrender by slot of time so the host told me you know that guy at the back his name is scotty is very good psychic he is going to ask you question i had a very hard time thinking what i'll say to him now but i remembered a very strange incident the strange incident was there was one income tax there was a customs officer in india with the same last name as mine his name was harbhajan singh puri and he told people he is my brother not a biological brother but by surname my brothers he joined some yogi swamis and became a yogi himself and became known as yogi bhajan and he moved to united states first to canada then to united states settled in california but he knew me as a custom officer i had traveled and met him and we had a few encounters in delhi in india so he had set up a white house on the west coast like the president's white house on the east coast he had his own white house a fashion like the president's white house he invited me when i was in one of my visits he invited me come and stay with me and i'll introduce you to all my disciples he had trained all his disciples to wear white turbans even the girls and boys all were wearing white turbans and so they, he was teaching them yoga teaching them spiritual things teaching them even some tenets of sikhism he he became a yogi and when i went there he put me up in the white house my wife and i stayed at his white house everything was white the uh, furniture was white the rugs carpets were all white the wall was white the ceiling was white all the people moving in and out were wearing white clothes white turbans it looked like just faces moving around by themselves <laughs> that background very interesting experience we had in that experience he said i'll be having interviews now and you come and sit with me and have tea i said all right but i said interviews mostly people want privacy no 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 there is nothing private from you you are my colleague come sit with me so i am sitting on a sofa with him and one middle aged lady comes for the next turn for interview and she says i have come for interview she says come on honey dear come sit with us this is ishwar puri my friend we'll have tea together very nicely he treated her i was very impressed he is a very kind person to first treat people with tea and all that before the interview i have never done that so i appreciated his gesture after the tea he said now sit on the floor interview will begin so she sat on the floor and he began to shout at her loudly i said yogi ji please let me go out no you sit here i was also very tamed by his voice he just sat there and he shouted so hard at her so badly 
using such bad language about who she is. I couldn't believe. This is a yogi talking like this to somebody who's come for an interview. This woman is never going to come again. What kind of interview is this? Anyway, we went out here, set up a lunch, dinner, or some lunch for everybody, some good meal. And I walked out. I was supposed to be guest of honor, but I didn't feel like that. I said, I am nobody here with this yogi shouting like that. I saw that lady. I went up to her. I said, please forgive me that I had to witness that strange scene of the yogi shouting at you. It was not good. And I, I tried to go out so that this should remain private, whatever it is. But he insisted. I said, please forgive me. He said, what forgiveness? She told me, the yogi was right. What he said was true. I deserve to hear that. I said, what is mistaken notion I had? These Americans must be very different. That they like to be shouted at and insulted and all that. I said, oh, is this some news for me? That the woman appreciated that, the big shouting. This incident came back to me when Scotty asked for his interview. I said, I am going to try the yogi trick today. <laughs> I'm telling you the background. Why I tried the yogi trick. When this man came for interview, he was the same smiling round face. I had got a big table between him and me in case he gets angry. There should be some defense. And he was sitting on a sofa. I was sitting on a chair like this. So as soon as he comes, I began to shout at him. I said, you being a psychic could not wait for one day to receive my message. And he felt alarmed that I spoke like that. So I raised my voice. Here is the message. Very short message. Don't destroy yourself. And he shook like this. He couldn't believe. I said, it's working. <laughs> so he raised my voice more. Don't destroy yourself. And he, again, he was completely limp. I said, it's working. Third time, even louder. Don't destroy yourself. And he fell away, fell down from the chair. I said, something has happened. And he said, thank you, thank you. And he went out. I don't know what he was thanking me for. I said, there was, whatever I tried worked. He goes, tells my host, this man is the best psychic. He knows everything. <laughs> he knows everything. He told me the real truth for which he had come. He said, don't destroy yourself. And I knew it's because of my drugs. I knew he knows I'm, I'm, I'm on drugs. And he said, I'm destroying myself. And again he said, don't destroy yourself. I knew I was in a bad company and doing something very wrong. Like orgies and all, in different type of uh, group. That is wrong. And he told me, don't destroy, I'm destroying myself. And third time when he said, don't destroy me, he realized even by the psychic work I'm doing, I'm destroying myself. I'll never do it again. The man's life changed from that moment. And he said, tell Linda Goodman, that great astrologer who written two big books, the real person to find her lost daughter has come. Now, I had no idea that uh, there was a big astrologer who written big books called Sun Times and Love Times. Some of you might have seen. Those big books, he is a great astrologer. And she, her daughter disappeared some years ago. They were in New York, the daughter disappeared. And the police, the police tracked her that she fell into the docks in the water and her remains have been found. They tested the remains. It is the daughter's. She didn't believe it because the horoscope said that she will come back. Then she can't die if she has to come back. And she believed in the horoscope that she herself cast of her daughter. So that is why everybody tried to find the daughter, including Scotty, and they could not find the daughter. They said, here's the man who has come from India. He can trace where the daughter is. That's me. I am supposed to trace her missing daughter. They told me, Linda Goodman has been informed of your presence in this country. 
and please help her. We have all failed. All the psychics have failed. You are the super psychic. You can find the daughter. I said, oh, what a mess I have created for myself. Just by doing something which Scotty thinks is great. Nothing I have done really. But they said, Linda Goodman lives in Denver or somewhere. And she's flying today to New York to take part in a television program. She wants you to come to New York and see her there. And she has said, no matter what, charter a special plane if necessary, but bring him there. And I'll be staying in that hotel, very expensive hotel, New York. I tried to find a way to escape from this somehow. I said, oh, New York, I've already come from New York. I am now in Chicago. From Chicago, I go to Minneapolis. And from there, I'm going to East, and I'm going back to India. We Punjabis never go back. <laughs> this is our tradition. We always go forward. Sorry, I can't go back to New York. They informed Linda Goodman. Persuade him. Get him a round-the-world ticket. <laughs> Let him go forward all the way and come back to New York. <laughs> if necessary, charter a plane. She had money, obviously, to do all that. So they told me they are going to take me around the world. <laughs> a second thought came to me. Why go around the world? I can go around a little bit in the US. And I suggested, I'll take a trip down from Colorado or Minneapolis. I'll go down to Orlando and come to New York. In Orlando, I'm very keen to see Disney World. <laughs> I was keen. They arranged my ticket immediately. And I laid down three conditions. One, I'll come by that route. Secondly, I'll stay in a hotel room more expensive than the one she's staying in. <laughs> Just to uh, attain a status equal to hers. <laughs> I knew in America this happens, that the status is based how much money you have. So room should be more expensive. They traced a room in the same suite. She was playing $300. They found one for $310 for me. A double room, two rooms, two showers. I'd never seen that before. <laughs> Thirdly, I will fix the time when I will see her. She can't call me. Now I'm free. And they agreed. I fix the time. I will see her at 3.28 p.m. 28 minutes past 3. I could have said 3.30. It doesn't appeal to an astrologer. <laughs> so just common sense. I use my common sense. OK, 3.28. 3.28 came. I had a nice shower. And I loved that hotel room. I said, this for a day, but I should enjoy. It's a good place. And I said, I will see her. In, they had an ante room next to the uh, hotel room where he was staying. And we were in the meeting room. I said, meet there, not in my set. 3.28, I was there. And I saw she sitting there with another chair for me and a teapot and a little cookies and some biscuits, something like that, and eight other people sitting there on chairs. I went and saw she greeted me. Said, Please sit down. I know you like uh, tea instead of coffee, and I know you like eggless cookies. I got everything for you. I said, thank you very much. She says, you know my, my issue for which you come to discuss this. I said, yes, uh, your friend, that host, told me about your issue, about your daughter. But if you want an interview with me, it has to be one-on-one, -on -one, not the crowd of people sitting around. She said, these are all astrologers. All of them had opened some books, which had some almanac books, which showed where the stars are at 328, why did he give that time? <laughs> they were studying that. And I am saying I will only give interview one on one. And if they want to stay here, I will not give interview. She says, they've come from far off just to hear you, what you can say about my daughter. I said, sorry, I don't give interviews like that. So I got up. Oh, please sit down, please sit down. Please leave the room and go upstairs and wait for me. 
They said, Linda, you invited us. And we come all the way to listen to this man and you are telling us to go away. She says, no. He says he won't give interview. Don't you want to listen? I'll tell you what he says. Just go. So she made them go out, except one heavy man sitting in one corner. He wouldn't go. She said, Phillips, you also go. He said, no, I'm not an astrologer. I am your security man. And the way this man is acting, this Indian guy, I can tell you the risk to your life. Otherwise, he wouldn't send everybody away. I will not go. I'll be here to secure your security. She said, he's not an astrologer. He's just a policeman. I hired him for my security. I said, if Phillips doesn't go, I will go. Phillips has to go. She persuaded Phillips. Look, I take responsibility for myself. Go. Philip said, you are taking a big risk, but I will go. He went out. She took them out and closed the door, came back. I said, Linda, that Phillips is standing outside the door. I knew that. I'd worked with the government myself. <laughs> the man won't run away anywhere. Please tell him to go upstairs. She went up. He was standing there. <laughs> then I heard her words. She spoke to Phillips. He knows everything. Go away. I said, my work is done. <laughs> She's already believing that I know everything. So she comes back and she says, now she's alone. She says, you know about my daughter disappearing. My chart says she will come back. How do we account for that? And I'm listening to her. Oh, she says, it's possible that she died and will be reborn. Reincarnation can come back. I said, hmm. <laughs> she said, now I can calculate uh, the, how she will be grow, what age she will be at this time. Now I can find that it'll look like that from her own chart. Now I can find out when she will come. That's the year she can come and I'll see her again according to my charts, but in a new body. And I said, hmm. <laughs> she said, have you come across the world just to say hmm to me? And I said, hmm. <laughs> Interview over. I'm telling you a true story. The answers were with, with her, not with me. She had her own answers. She just wanted an excuse to discover her own answers, which she gave me. She, I said, call everybody down. They all came. What did he say? She couldn't say. He just said three hoons. <laughs> <laughs> so, so this thing became very well known, that this is a man who could just say, hmm, and give the answer. This thing went around. And then she said, please, before you leave, I want you to see an unpublished book. Only the, uh, the, only the manuscript is ready, typed manuscript. And I'll read out just one sentence, one paragraph. So she pulled out a typed manuscript, a big one, thick. Page 256, I remember. She opened page 256, said, read this paragraph. She said, I know you already know what is there, but still read it for my sake. And I read it. It said, and one day... A man will come from the East and will use no words but give you your answers. These that she had recorded much earlier in that new manuscript. So it clicked in her mind immediately that this was that event. So sometimes these things happen and that thing that you don't have to speak to give an answer is true. We all have our answers inside us. Sometimes we just want somebody to verbalize it, vocalize it, speak it out. When, when somebody asks a question and I give an answer, they say, yes, that is it. How can somebody say, yes, that is it, if they didn't know the answer already? And if I give a foolish answer, no. That means they know the answer. All answers are inside us. We are, they are not answered already. Somebody comes in whom we have some faith and trust, and the answers come from within. 
I'm telling these stories just to tell you everything is inside us, everything, including answers to all our questions. So next time you come for interview and you only hear, hmm, please don't mind it. <laughs> Thank you very much for spending this time with me and you allowed me to tell these stories to you and uh, very happy to see all of you. Hope to see you again sometime. And take care, have your nice journeys back.